Hey, Lori, welcome to the podcast. Really glad to have you here. Uh, time zones are crazy. Uh, you're in the UK, I'm in Vancouver, but I'm glad that we connected here. Um, before we get started, uh, do you want to just take 30, 60 seconds, just introduce yourself, who is Lori, and uh, yeah, what do you do? Yeah, so I'm a digital marketing strategist by trade. I've been doing this for over a decade. And actually, I started, and I always joke about this, really dating myself a little bit here, but I started when Facebook was still called thefacebook.com, which is, uh, you know, quite a few years ago. And ever since then, I've seen this whole evolution of how digital marketing has completely changed the landscape of everything we do in our business, right? And how we're now, even as creators, be able to show up online differently to leverage all these different amazing channels at our disposal. So I help teams and individual, you know, creators, individual uh, business owners, figure out how to get people to click, sign up and also buy. And I use these key terms here because, you know, really demonstrates the kind of journey that the average customer or client would take from the moment they find you, the moment they actually trust you, eventually to actually want to buy from you. And I think that's really key is to think about how do we bring that customer journey across the digital landscape? to make it work well for your business and also to make you create a loyal fan in the process as well. And you can find me on my website. So, and also my YouTube channel, which is where, you know, Rob, you, you and I connected on my YouTube content. So you can find me on Lori Wang, just type into YouTube, you can find me there. And there are actually lots of other free videos that you can check out all about how to learn more about this area of digital marketing as well. Awesome. Awesome. I love that. I can't believe, uh, I don't I forgot that it was called the Facebook before I thought it was always just <laughs> Facebook but I guess so like you know thinking back to the early days of uh yeah it was the Facebook um that's so funny and now it's meta it's not even Facebook at all anymore I guess yeah. it's still but meta um no that's crazy what a crazy journey so you okay so you were working there but before Facebook or the Facebook were you in like uh agency world or were you doing other tech or where, where were you before that yeah, so I had a really interesting career change. I, mm. like many other first gen generation immigrant parents, you know, they yeah. kind of push you towards either, you know, medicine or law or finance. Yeah. <laughs> and me being a sensible one, I was taking economics as a degree. So yeah. I went to finance after gra graduation. Yeah. Um, but then five years into that role, you know, I was kind of obviously learning lots of it. And I'm very grateful to this day for all the professional experiences I got from that but it wasn't really something I'm passionate about. Mm. And I started doing a bit of soul searching and came across a friend of mine who was working at a digital agency over in New York. And I just sent him a Facebook message saying, you know, I'd love to know more about what you're doing. This sounds like a really cool area. And he actually gave me the friend of his working in the London office to actually have an informational coffee with him. So I went to have a coffee, didn't think too much of it. And we just had a very casual conversation about what he's doing. And I actually just, I was fascinated because this whole area was just about to really pick up steam. Yeah. And I saw the potential what it could become eventually. And I thought, this actually sounds too fun to be doing as a job. <laughs> and I basically kind of left it at that. Yeah. And four months later, funny enough, they had a role available in their team as a very junior position, um, working with financial clients, but from a digital marketing perspective. So wow. it was like the perfect fit. <laughs> within, within the Facebook? Like uh, no, actually, this was, this was part of the digital agency, uh, oh, Ogilvy. Digital agency. Okay, okay, gotcha. So Ogilvy is part of the WPP um, advertising umbrella. Gotcha. And uh, they basically kind of had some of the biggest market shares over oh. here in the UK anyway, as well, with regards to that area. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I was just very lucky to kind of have that lucky break to get in at that very kind of interesting intersection of time, but also my experience as well. And then really build it up from there. Um, and yeah, once I joined the agency, basically that was the start of when I learned the dark arts of digital marketing. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> yeah, it can be dark for sure. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's true. Yeah. Uh, so then basically, okay, so lesson learned there is take up any sort of coffee introductions. You know, you never know where they go for sure. Um, and so, okay, so now you're in the agency and so you're learning the craft, you're getting, uh, and, and then what was next for you there? I'm just trying to figure out what the bridge was to get to be working at, at Meta. And, uh, and then also you did some work at Google as well, I think. Yeah, so. That's right, yeah. So about a year and a half into my digital agency role, uh, at this time, I just feel like I really learned as much as I could have from that role. And I was promoted actually very quickly within the team. Nice. Um, someone from Google reached out to me to tell me about an interesting project they're working on. 
mm. which is basically a training program across the UK uh, that's designed for individuals and business owners who don't normally have the access to resources for larger agencies to help them with, let's say, you know, advertising campaigns, mm -hmm. for them to learn this on their own mm -hmm. through a specific design curriculum. And we'll be rolling this out across the UK, traveling the country to do that with them. And that just thought, it sounded like an amazing opportunity. So for me, you know, that was the time when I really jumped ship to Google. And that's when I started working on that program, which is something that's close to my heart. And they're still running it to this day. So for wow. the, those there are creators, let's say in the US or in UK, um, there's the equivalent of this program in the UK that's called, uh, in the US called Digital Garage. Mm. So uh, you can look it up on online. There's also an online program you can sign up to, like lots of online courses on social media, content marketing, SEO, things like that. So when I really saw the impact that this had on individuals who are either trying to level their careers, who are trying to grow their businesses, I thought there's a lot of potential here in terms of what else I can do after the program. So when they wrapped up, I was just thinking, well, maybe this is time for me to start something on my own. Maybe this mm. is the, the chance, right, to jump into it. Uh, so that's when I started my own consultancy, essentially splitting between one-to-one -one service based work, where it's, let's say, working with an individual client on their digital marketing strategy and how to create their email marketing campaign to on the other side, when it's more training led. So mm -hmm. training individuals or larger teams within the company on how to, let's say, run Facebook ads effectively. So that was really kind of the mix of the business that I had then. And yeah, that kind of really brought me to where I am today. And during that period, I also was working with Meta mm -hmm. on the She Means Business program which is basically helping individual female entrepreneurs to use Facebook ads to grow their business online as well. Wow, wow, what a, and, and what year was this? Just to give some sort of like wrap our head around the timeline. Yeah, so I would say range between 2016 and to about 2019-ish. 19-ish. Um, yeah, so around those three years mark really. Nice, nice. And then you uh, started your own consultancy, your own agency around that time then, around 2019 or so? And uh, so right, just right around the start of the pandemic, which is interesting. So just right. actually, just after the wrapping, I, I would say maybe more like end of 2018. So 2019 mm -hmm. was a bit of overlap um, mm -hmm. when I worked on that meta program, but that was more kind of through my own consultancy as mm -hmm. well um, as an advisor in a way on that sense. That's amazing. I mean, that's great, almost uh, just great knowledge base to kind of take. And I'm, I'm sure that's like a very natural uh, progression, you know, as you kind of evolve and, and you kind of get to know the ins and outs of uh, operations and, and working from a Google or a, a Meta. Um, you either continue going up the corporate world of that uh, path or you break off and, you know, you uh, serve people directly. So that's an interesting. Um, was that scary? Was that a scary jump? Was that like you know, like, are you naturally like, oh, yeah, no, this is going to be great. Like, or are you are you like, oh, it's a little scary, <laughs> but I think I can do this or like, how, what was your mind at uh, during that big leap? Yeah, I'm not gonna lie. I mean, there were definitely <laughs> nights in the beginning of that period when you know, you were kind of just staying awake at night thinking about your cash flow and everything else, how long a runway you have in your own business. <laughs> of um, luckily, I didn't have a kid then, but now that I have a kid, I can imagine that being even more stressful for those of you guys who are starting out. So yeah. I definitely feel um, feel for them in terms of on that pain side, because I definitely had that. And I think a lot of it comes down to preparation. Mm. So I shared about this recently, another podcast I was on, and it's more about thinking, how much runway can you give yourself during that initial few months of your business to make sure you don't feel that stress and the pressure as much as you can? So that's when I started preparing in the background by, for example, you know, saving a little bit portion of my salary every single month to make sure that I am putting into this pot of money that can give me some of that safety safety net, really, right? During that first few months when you're just finding your feet, trying to get yourself up and running. And the other part of the preparation really is to make sure you have that feeler on the ground on where your next new business and new clients can come from. So start the process earlier, maybe while you're still working, you know, go to some networking events, talking to individuals who are in similar shoes of yours, maybe working a little bit ahead of you. And maybe go to, for example, some of the networking events. Also think about how you can potentially bring some new clients as initial inquiries from that as well. And part of that also comes back to my marketing background. So always preparing beforehand and so thinking about who your target audience is 
And are you going to be serving the right kind of audience when you're actually launching your business for that new uh, customer base? So all of this really comes back to just thinking ahead of time and giving yourself as much of that period before you really jump off ship to kind of get your feet wet and not to feel like you're literally just kind of straight plunge into cold water when you get in. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I feel like the way you're describing it is how you would also advise, you know, your clients, right? Like uh, that are that are sort of like going into a new venture or, uh, you know, preparation and, uh, you know, putting money aside. I'm kind of thinking through even like, you know, for creators now and I'm sure we're, you know, cr you're a creator now officially. You, you've been a creator for a while. Um, you know, as creators, uh, they're always looking at like, hey, you know, I'm, I want to launch this new revenue stream. I want to launch, uh, you know, memberships or courses. So I want to speak or and, um, you know, of course, if you want to launch something and put time into something, then you're taking time away from something else that you may be already working. And so um, do you think that that's sort of the same framework of, you know, pre preparing, even though you have a bit of a, you know, you already have some revenue streams when you launched revenue streams, is it almost like launching and going off and starting a new business or is it a little easier? Like, how would you think that through? What's a sort of the, the contrast there? Yeah, I would say, you know, simplicity is probably the best approach in my opinion, because I think with anything in regards to businesses, um, people obviously there are lots of these talks online. I'm sure you've seen these YouTube videos where it talks about passive income and how you can create as many streams as possible of different income streams in your business. While I think that has its own merit, I think a lot of times what you want to also focus on is, you know, what are some of the main areas that you want to focus in your business right now, rather than being too distracted by too many different income streams or business potentials? Because like you said, Rob, every time you put your focus onto one thing, that really takes away the attention you could get or the time and resources that you have onto something else. And when you do have this new idea or new channel or, or new income stream you want to launch, really think very carefully as I did back then, that question of what is it for? Mm -hmm. Because you know when you really reflect on that and whether or not this is something you want to pursue in the long term, because you know a lot of times when you have all these different uh, models being injected into your business, let's say you know doing a speaking circuit, doing the memberships, uh, doing the courses, all these will take time and resources. And for you know single creators out there like myself, I can imagine you only have a limited amount of time available to do everything and to do everything right and the right quality that you want your audiences to perceive you as. So one of the best decisions I made was being very simple in the beginning of that creator journey. So focus on one channel, in this case, YouTube, because I know that if I spread myself too thin on different channels, I probably won't be able to do a very good job on all of them and probably won't grow as quickly on all of them as well. So I focus on one channel, um, which is my main one. And then anything else around that, the content I created, I could repurpose that on all of my other channels if I wanted to. So there's this kind of one central idea there with content creation. But also regards to the business side, you know, I have this one business where it's a digital marketing training and consulting company. That's the main part of my service-based model. And then on the other side, on the, on the creator side, obviously there's the, the sponsorship side, the brand deals with specific brands I work with on, on my YouTube channel. But aside from that, really just another course part, and that was pretty much it. Mm -hmm. So I, I could have a lot more you know, income streams on different avenues, but I feel like it wouldn't do my audience justice and also wouldn't be able to spend as much attention and care as I like to. So one thing that, you know, we've been talking about, I'm thinking into the future is to carefully curate a community uh, of people that I can have as part of a membership. But I haven't launched that just yet. The reason for that is because I've been very careful about thinking around the methodology behind that. How big of a community do I want to create? How long of a membership is going to be? Things like that, where I want to make sure that from the get go, it's very much kind of um, with the care and intention that I can put in as much as possible to create a community of people that care about this central philosophy that I'm, I'm, I'm building. And also they want to show up regularly to be there for the community. And I want it to be a place where people want to be part of as well. So that's something I've been thinking about in the background. Yeah, I love that. I have a huge respect for that sort of uh, mentality of simplicity. Don't do everything. You know, there's a lot of, uh, you know, there's a lot of voices out there on YouTube that tells creators to, uh, you know, build, build 28 revenue streams, you know, and uh, it's crazy, right? It's a lot, uh, especially for a create one, maybe a solo creator or somebody with a very small team or a VA or something. 
Um, I imagine if you're a media company, which I think creators, I think that's kind of what I think of them now is like if they have a huge team, they're like a media company. They're not a, they're still a creator, but they're like more of a CEO and, you know, they're running, it's a different game that they have. And yeah, sure. And then have the 28 or, you know, uh, 20 plus different revenue streams. But um, yeah, have you huge respect for being, you know, saying no to a lot of opportunities and like really focusing on the ones that, like you said, um, serves your clients and your community the best and um you know thinking through uh what to launch and not jumping right away you know i do see i see your um you know just with the content like you said you focus on youtube and the the fruits are showing right your youtube channel is growing it's steady and then on the on the business side you've got your consultancy and and that's also steady and, and you're not overwhelmed you're able to go to new york and you know with your family and travel <laughs> Exactly. And think about, you know, what is the kind of life that you want to create around exactly. your business as well? Because I know many people who have this massive business and they're actually not very happy being in it. And that's the thing to really reflect on is mm -hmm. if you're creating this thing around your life, around your own terms, make it something that you're happy to be in to wake up in every single day, right? Think about what do you like doing that you want to create into an income stream yeah. and pursue that. Um, I think that that's the key thing here. I do feel like Nowadays, a lot of people have not a lack of resources, but really it's a lack of time. And time is one of our biggest, I would say, um, you know, currencies of our current generation. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Yeah, right. Yeah. And and have a place where you're content. Otherwise, you're, 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 you can continue to chase forever. And uh, yeah. And then you just run out of time and you wake up and you're like, oh, man, where'd time go? <laughs> you know, so. Yeah. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it is not worth, you know, I mean, you know, you, we, we've uh you know we've spoken to a lot of different creators and uh even you know sort of on the personal side spoken to a lot of older people that are a couple stations ahead and uh man you know they would trade a lot of money to get some time back you know with their families and things like that right so um no i respect your mentality there and how how you're growing your business um what is uh what's what is what comes to mind when when uh you know, when I say YouTube and, and your channel or just YouTube in general, what do you feel, uh, you know, is kind of going on there? I know it's 2023. Somebody might be listening to this in 2026 and they're like, YouTube is totally different now. It's like a, you know, it's like a hardware company. But uh, yeah, you know, as, of, as of right now, what do you yeah, what do you feel about YouTube? What's just sort of like your relationship with YouTube, with your channel and, and your creator and your audience there? How do you feel about it? Yeah, I feel like YouTube has changed ever since I first joined the platform. And the reason for that is because social media in general, as we've seen across the board, have changed in that aspect, is that now the algorithms have shifted towards having attention first versus uh, audience first. So what I mean by that is back in the day on YouTube, you can have a massive channel, right? Let, let's say over a million subscribers. And usually that's what drives the additional views you would get in your future videos. Because when you publish the next video, then those million subscribers get notified and they'll see you on their feed and they'll also be able to watch your videos because of that. But why I've seen an interesting shift in YouTube and any other social media channels out there is that now we're looking at more of a content-based type of algorithm. And what that means is you can be someone with, let's say, 10 subscribers on YouTube right now, but there's massive opportunities for you to create that next piece of content where it gets discovered by the YouTube algorithm and being shown to as many individuals as possible because they love watching it so much. And they're getting that positive uh, feedback from the, obviously the engagement on the video, the watch time, and then you being someone with a very small audience, kind of a massive exposure on the platform. So I think that's where the opportunity is, is that nowadays for smaller creators and smaller brands, there's a much more capacity to be able to reach a larger audience in a very small amount of time. Mm, got it. Yeah, it definitely has changed, I feel like, too. Yeah, I mean, over the years, for sure. Uh, look at your channel, though. I mean, you've got a video here that's almost like 100,000 views. Um, it looks like, you know, people want to learn about digital marketing. A lot of people, almost 100,000 people uh, definitely want to learn about it. And uh, yeah, no, it's great. What do you what do you feel like um, is contributing to your success with with YouTube? Like, w what do you think kind of, you know, got you to the place where you are? Um, and uh, and do you see it as like a place where you can either grow really quickly or is it like a long term thing that you're looking at with YouTube? 
Yeah, so uh, my journey into YouTube was very unexpected. If you remember, we had a chat about this, Rob, before, and it was when a client of mine was really struggling to install a Facebook pixel on her website. Yeah. And those of you guys who have been through that process, you know what I mean, it's painful sometimes. Yeah. So I actually recorded a whole step-by-step -step video to show her, literally just the on-screen kind of direction type of thing. It wasn't anything fancy. And I just put it on YouTube as a way to share the link with her, but obviously had it as a public link. So after I shared it with her, she was watching it. She found it quite helpful. I didn't think too much of it. But a few months later, that video started to pick up traffic on my channel. It's probably one of the earliest, you know, really bad lighting type of videos that you could see there. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and I started realizing there is potential here because obviously digging onto my Google hat and YouTube's the second largest search engine online, people are always looking for information on how to do something or help them with something. And why don't I just start creating more interesting, helpful videos for people, given what I know. And digital marketing has always been my interest, my passion. So I thought just focus on that. And that's when I just started doing videos, not very regularly, but just once in a while, whenever I had time away from my client work. And it was more of a personal hobby type of thing. And I just started doing that, but eventually really took it seriously, I would say during the pandemic, when I had a little bit more time on my hands, and I thought, why not use this opportunity given everyone's attention is focusing on to online, they can't go outside mm. and start publishing more videos regularly. Mm. So I would say from since then, really start seeing that consistent growth on the channel because of it. So I think obviously consistency of publishing on YouTube is part of that, that equation. And the way I see it is that, you know, how to think about content in the right way to make people want to watch your videos. And I think that's one of the things I really contributed to the growth of the channel over time is I already assume my own video is boring because I know that the topic I'm talking about is not the most exciting thing in the world. I will never be able to compete with Mr. Beast, for example, doing those grandiose gestures right. that he does on his channel. But obviously my audience is also, is also very different. Mm -hmm. But I'm the way I think about it is that if I assume my video is boring by default, how do I make it more interesting to people to watch? then that case is learning about different editing techniques, right? To make it more faster on screen, to make more graphics on the screen where people can actually get um, the information that they need in very visual format. So I learned a lot from, you know, creators like, for example, Ali Abdal. He does that really well in his videos. A lot of his videos are very much knowledge-based, but he has a, a way to actually communicate that knowledge in a very effective way. So people want to stay around and watch the content. Mm. So, um, and the way I think about it is, it's not so much I want to aim for YouTube to show my videos to more people because of my watch time, but the more interesting I can make my videos, the more individuals around the world can actually get um, impacted in, in a much more positive way because they can you know, obviously learn from that video. They can apply to what they do in their career, in their business. And really that's where I kind of approach this uh, analysis of how I can make my content better is if I was someone that's watching on the other side of the world, on the other side of that screen, do I want to sit here for the next 10 minutes and watch this video? Yeah, yeah. I think that's a, that's a really good uh, sort of like filter with your own content, right? Is it helpful and, and will it impact somebody? Which kind of leads me to my next question around thought leadership. I mean, if you go to your website, if you guys go and you guys, there's a link to this. Uh, you do a lot of speaking. You're a thought leader, right? You're sharing ideas and people are, are really catching those ideas that you're throwing out there. And I think it's really helpful. Uh, you're helping business owners and creators and all sorts of people, right? Um, and so what, what comes to mind around the term thought leadership uh, for you? Yeah, so I think about this uh, from any creator or any individual, I, I suppose, expert led type of business or consultants is that you always start off with this one topic that you're very passionate about. So this mm -hmm. one thing that you know, you could be doing it in your sleep, you're thinking about it all day, all, all night. And basically, if this one topic that you're interested in, pursue that, right? Just literally think about how you can create more content or consume as much content around that as possible in the early days, where you're seeing how other people are talking about it, um, what other individual consultants or experts are saying about this topic as well, and really take that all in. And I think the next stage of that thought leadership really is about taking all this input of information, and then taking your own unique spin on that because we all have our own unique perspectives on how we really think about specific parts of our our knowledge or our, our expertise. Yeah. And then creating content around that, doing that consistently for maybe two to three years. And I think everyone can eventually become a thought leader in their specific area because we all start off with 
that beginner mindset, right? We do everything from a from scratch, learning as we go along, as I did. And then as you're learning, you're also injecting your own personal take on things, which is what people really follow you for. And eventually be able to create your own specific brand and your own values around that and sharing that with people around the world. Yeah, that's that's uh, I, I like that thought. I um, I I hear a lot of creators that get sort of like this shiny object symbol. Is it shiny object? Shiny object symbol. Is it shiny object? How do you Syndrome, call it? right? Syndrome. Syndrome. Yes. Syndrome. That's sorry, it. sorry. It's so early here. Uh, <laughs> still waking up. No, I appreciate yeah. being so up, shiny, <laughs> up shiny, so early know, for me. <laughs> uh, we got the coffee going. It's all good. Uh, we're good. Oh. But yes, shiny objects, right? And so um, and so yes. What you said, you know, talk about this uh, topic or this idea, this framework for, you know, a long time, two, three years. Man, a lot of creators can't even make like three or four videos around the same thing before they switch their mind into like, hey, I want to be an expert or a thought leader around this thing instead or like AI or something, you know, whatever the, the hottest thing, trending thing is out there. And so what's what's some advice you've given? Because. I do see, you know, as I look through, you know, I'm looking at your website and as we have been talking and, you know, you've really, you've really done a beautiful job of like taking your um, experience, you know, meta, Google agency, and really like packaging that into now this really easy to consume service and, and knowledge base uh, through your, um, you know, through your consultancy, helping almost the same people, I guess, right? And so you really are, you know, when you say like, talk about the same thing for a long time, you've really done that really well. You seem to be really enjoying it as well. And so what are, how, what, what have you done to like stay focused? I, I guess is my question there. Cause uh, I do see a lot of creators and entrepreneurs with just so many, we have a plethora of opportunities in our society these days. So it's like really easy to be sidetracked and pulled in different directions. What's, what's kept you focused? I think um, obviously the thing about distractions is that we have so much information at our fingertips nowadays. And I feel like, you know, for anyone out there who is currently suffering from this, you're definitely not alone. And I myself have to constantly remind myself to stay in my lane and just kind of continue pushing forward on that. Because there's many times when I consider like, do I want to keep on pushing forward on this digital marketing track, right? Because there are lots of other topics I'm interested in. And I think there are lots of other multi-passionate creators or entrepreneurs out there listening to this. And I'm sure you probably feel the same way. You know, there are lots of peripheral, I suppose, complementary topics that occasionally I do inject into my own content or what I talk about. Um, but I try to be very careful in the sense that think about the overall target audience I'm talking to and also one actually eventually driving the audience towards. That's the key thing here is that what's your overall business objective. Because for me, I always come back to the idea of in my business, I'm eventually looking to either help service someone with regards to their specific strategy or maybe their their thinking process on, around their marketing, or it could be them reaching out to me for, let's say, a training on the marketing specific topic for their company or for their own individual um, business. So when it comes to the original business objectives, then thinking back to, okay, what kind of content do I create? to make people want to learn more about that and eventually come to me for as well. So I think that really helped me stay focused because a lot of it is really kind of business driven decisions on doing that rather than just creating content for content's sake mm -hmm. and not really seeing any potential, I suppose, results from that. Because a lot of times we could be really dragged into this race of this hamster wheel mm -hmm. of constantly creating content to feed these different social media platforms. But at the end of the day, what are you doing that content for? Is there a result you're looking for from that? Yeah, yeah, that's good. Great advice. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, uh, you know, a friend of ours uh, here at U Screen, his name is Justin Moore. He, he's sort of the same thing. I love he's, him. Yeah, he's yeah, great. he's great. And, yeah, and you know, when I talk to him and say, you know, like, hey, how did you become the sponsorship creator, sponsorship expert all of a sudden? You know, and he's like, no, it's not all of a sudden. I've been talking about this for like four years on Twitter and on LinkedIn and uh, Instagram and YouTube, and and you know, finally, you know, uh, in the last, I would say, probably year. It's like everybody knows him as that now. And so, um, you know, it's it's patience and patience and planting those seeds and, and then, uh, yeah, just being patient. And I guess kind of what I caught there from your answer is that um, you also look to the people you're serving and almost validation and just remembering like, hey, here are the people I'm serving. And, and I like what you said about staying in your lane because it's really hard. It's really hard. Yeah. So, um, 
Yeah, I love that. And I have to say, you know, shiny object syndrome like everyone else. So don't worry about that one. (laughs) (laughs) It's something that we have to constantly fight against, I think, as, you know, entrepreneurs and creators, because there's always a new social media platform getting your attention that's saying it's the next massive opportunity, or there's always another income stream that people are saying, you know, you're missing out by not doing this. So it's, it's definitely there. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's uh, also a bit of a fear of uh, I might get left behind or, uh, you know, if I don't take this on, like, oh, maybe like, uh, you don't know, I'm, I might, I might, uh, you know, I might get outdated or irrelevant. Um, but uh, there's definitely some things there that are, you know, sort of like will ride out all of all of those trends. Um, as we wrap up here, you know, you've you've gone from corporate uh, to now running your own business, entrepreneurship. Like, what's that been like? What's your, how's your day changed? Uh, you did say now you have a, you have a family now, right? Of course. So uh, it's a beautiful thing. And so how is, how is like the corporate life versus uh, your current life uh, running your own agency and doing your own, running your own business? Has, how's that been different? Yeah, I would say honesty wise, it's been a beautiful journey, but at the same time, it's been messy at the same time. And <laughs> you know, messy in the sense that, like you said, now blended in with the family on top of that as well. So I had my daughter during the pandemic. And at the same time, my husband, um, Simon, has also been writing his book with Penguin Random House called Energize. Um, and that's been a really interesting journey because we didn't expect to have this new baby come at the same time of both of us still launching our businesses and running it. And he's also having to you know, write a book in the midst of a pandemic where everyone's locked in. So um, having been gone through that experience, I think now nothing really phases me <laughs> <laughs> on the chaos side, I would say. And really just kind of taking each day as it goes. Um, I think one of my one of my biggest lessons I've taken away so far is in the sense that there is no sense of balance in what I'm doing now, especially you know, if there's any moms listening to this, they might feel the same way, yeah. is that you will always feel that you're out of balance at certain points, either towards your work, towards your kids, towards family. But at the same time, it's about learning how to tilt rather than balance. Yeah. So you're constantly tilting towards what needs your attention the most. <laughs> so true. <laughs> <laughs> so true. So true. I like that analogy. Somebody said once, like, uh, I did ask, I used to ask like, hey, how do you find work-life balance? One, one, uh, one guest gave me a really good answer where he said like, there's never a balance. It's always like just a new normal. Like there's seasons of it. And it's like, hey, this season, this is our normal. So it's like so, same thing that you're saying is that you just tilt. Like, hey, this season we're tilting to this normal. Next season might be a different tilt the other way. And it's our new normal for a season, right? And so, yeah, that's that's awesome. That's awesome. So you... You, you guys are a power couple. I didn't even realize that you guys, <laughs> we got an author, you got this uh, digital, uh, you know, uh, agency, uh, you know, that's running, running, you're running your business. So um, how do you guys, you guys both work from home? How does that work? Yeah, so we do a mixture. So there's cool. a place in London where we rent uh, together and kind of okay. go in for some co-working days because when you stay all day at home, it's going to drive you crazy, <laughs> especially with a toddler running around. Right. Uh, so luckily, she has school until 3 p.m. And before that, two of us really juggle that around the two of us. So one of us do drop off, the other person kind of get into, into that space to work yep. or, you know, both of us maybe going together. Um, and then most of the time, it's really kind of him, his laptop versus my laptop facing each other, doing our own thing, me trying to put my headphones on so that he doesn't talk to me. (laughs) (laughs) That's so funny. That's so funny. Well, yeah, you got to do what you got to do. That's great. Uh, This is like the new normal, right? Um, It is, yeah. That's awesome. Well, um, I want to respect your time. This has been amazing. It's really it's just insightful. I love, you know, that you shared your experience with us. Um, and uh, I think you're just doing amazing work out there, Lori. So uh, excited to oh, I'm glad that we connected through YouTube. You know, this is how, you know, people wonder, what do you do, Rob? I just cruise YouTube for people I want to learn from. And uh, and so, yes, that's what I do. No. Um, uh, but yeah, no, honestly, thank you so much for your time. Um, where can people connect no, with you, learn about what you're doing, maybe even, you know, uh, connect with you to work with you and um, you know with your agency and get some uh, coaching and consulting yeah I would say my website is probably the best place so lauriewang.com um, you find the link probably in the show notes after and on there you can see all the different type of um, services I offer both so you can reach out for specific training or maybe kind of consulting inquiries in the contact me page and also if you want to make it easier for yourself you can always email me directly at laurie at lauriewang.com 
Perfect. Perfect. Awesome. Yeah, I'll have all the links and everything in the show notes and in the description. Um, and uh, Lori, thank you so much for your time. I'm sure we will talk again soon. Thanks, Ralph, for having me.